Well, good evening. Um, oh, that was really good. Thank you all for responding. You don't always know what you're going to get up here. I hope that all of you are having a great week so far. Uh, it's great to get to spend this time with all of you here tonight. It's good to see you, uh, including those of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that everyone in so many different ways is able to join us here. I hope that God has worked clearly and powerfully in your lives this week. It's my prayer for you. Across the street at Fort Worth Christian, our high school students are on service week. So some of them are here nearby doing different service projects and activities around the community. Some are far away in other parts of the globe. In fact, our very own Kelly Samsel is leading a group of them right now at Nema Village. Uh, she took some of our students and is with them there now. It just strikes me, uh, thinking about these things, how much God can do through just a small group of people how much he's able to work just through a few who are willing to give their time and energy and attention to his will for this world. And I hope that you have felt God work through you, even though uh, you are just you this week uh, to accomplish his will, at least for moments in time. Um, it might not be all of the time that we feel that, but I feel like all of us hopefully can at moments feel the presence and power of God throughout our week. And my prayer is that you will feel that as we continue in our week together. So we're going to be continuing in our series tonight uh, that we started several weeks ago that's called Fish Out of Water. Uh, we've been talking about these things, the life of Joseph and Daniel, and how they find themselves in places that they probably didn't expect to wind up. Uh, they feel a little bit out of place, and they have to try and navigate uh, what it is to be in a place that is not their home. And so tonight we'll be picking up again in the life of Joseph, as he tries to navigate the messy situation that has landed him in the land of Egypt, a place that is very different from the land where his family lives. And the last time we saw Joseph, his fortunes were starting to look up. Like things were looking like they might get better for him as Pharaoh finally heard about this incredible man who's in prison, who's able to interpret and understand dreams. Uh, you may recall Stephen talking to us about how Joseph did not take that credit for himself when he was called to Pharaoh to interpret the dream, but he promised Pharaoh that his God would be able to interpret his dream. Tonight we'll be picking up again in Joseph's story and talking about what happens next. But before we do that, I want to share just a short story with you. When I was in elementary school, uh, it was not an uncommon thing, and maybe this it was how your elementary experience was as well. It was not an uncommon thing for students in my very small class in rural Arkansas to pick on one another. Maybe you know something about little elementary kids doing that. Maybe some of you have kiddos are saying they're still the same. I hope that they've grown out of that, but maybe they haven't. Sometimes on occasion this would happen to me. I would pick on others or be the one that was getting picked on. I've been told that I was an easy target as a young child. I would really give people the reaction that they wanted. So one time I remember my friend Nolan decided that he was going to spread some uh, ill will about me in the class. We had had a fight at recess one day uh, because he said I was being mean to him. Apparently it's considered mean to beat someone badly in kickball. Like this is a mean thing. But you can decide for yourselves if that was right or not. Nolan told the entire class how mean I was. And apparently, none of them were willing to stand up and say anything different about it. And so now they've all listened to his story. I'm the bad guy in the class. And I don't know why they all just decided to go along with it. I don't feel like my behavior on a day-to-day -day basis would suggest that I was a mean person. But they all just kind of let him go around saying this. No one stood up for me. It's pretty deflating to have all of your friends just accept something that you don't think is true about yourself. And all this just happened to occur right before my birthday. And every year, I remember, my mom was an awesome mom uh, about coming up to school and spending time with us. Awesome in a lot of ways, but awesome in that she would come up every year on my birthday and she would bring this big cookie cake from Walmart for my small class to enjoy together. Uh, maybe you've had one of those. They're, they're great. I highly recommend Walmart cookie cakes. And I had already decided, I told my mom, I said, Mom, when you bring that thing up here, Nolan is not getting any of it. Like, he is not partaking of the glorious cookie cake from Walmart. 
And she said that was not an option. Uh, He was going to have some of it. But when time came for us to all share in this cake together, it wasn't actually Noam that bothered me the most. It was as I watched these other students in my class who had kind of left me high and dry when no one was slandering my name as they came up to me with beaming smiles and said, can't I have some of the cake? Could I have a piece of it? It just really irked me, right, that they had been there and had allowed this indecency to happen to me. And now that I had cake, all was well. Everything was good. I wasn't the mean kid anymore. I want your cake, they told me. It just didn't sit very well with me. And it wasn't as if I, they had really done anything wrong. They hadn't wronged me in any way. They just didn't help me when they probably could have. So now as a young child, I thought to myself, why would I help you? Why would I give you some of this cake now that you want something from me? And of course, my mom and her wisdom again disagreed with that logic. And I can say that all the students enjoyed the cake very much on that day. I don't quite know how Joseph felt as he went from those jail rags that he had been living in for the last couple of years to riches. But I don't think that any of us in this room would have been surprised if what we read next in our story about Joseph was that he decided to take revenge on some of those people who had done him wrong. I know that I would want to talk to that cupbearer if I was Joseph. You know, the one who was supposed to tell Pharaoh about him whenever he had his dream interpreted by Joseph and got out of prison. I don't think that it would have been shocking to see Joseph use his new power, his new position that's given to him by Pharaoh, and say, this is it. Now I'm going to live life the way I want to, luxuriously, with no worries or concerns. At the very least, I don't think that anybody would blame Joseph for showing some level of apathy toward the people who did nothing to help him in his hour of need. But that's not what we're going to see from Joseph at all in our text here tonight. Joseph is not an Egyptian. I want us to remember that as we begin reading together tonight. He was not an Egyptian. In fact, he was only in Egypt because he was dragged there against his will after being sold into slavery by his brothers. And we can assume that since Joseph knows the God of his father Jacob, he also knows those promises that God has made to his father Jacob and to his grandfather Isaac and his great-grandfather Abraham. That his family is destined to live in another land. A land that is not Egypt. I think that it would be easy for Joseph to take his new power and his status and just spend some time here taking care of himself, biding his time, if you will. None of us would argue with it. We might even say that Joseph deserves that. He's been faithful to God, and God is now giving him the reward for his labor. He's been through a lot. Could you blame Joseph if he now spent a little bit of time relaxing, enjoying himself, trying to find a way to return home to his father? Maybe not to his brothers. Maybe some of his revenge is still burning for them. But at least to go back and see his father again? Maybe he would just wait until God finishes whatever it is that Joseph thinks he's trying to do here. But Joseph's response to Pharaoh's appointment was the exact opposite of this. It was the exact opposite of an apathy that we might expect. And I think it's what makes Joseph such a great example for us as we try to live our lives today as fish out of water, as people who maybe feel out of place in our own world and our culture. So let's read together tonight just a little bit from Joseph's story, and I think you'll begin to get the picture of what we're talking about. If you would go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 41. It's where Stephen left off a few weeks ago, and it's where we'll be continuing tonight in our story. In fact, we'll read a couple verses that Stephen ended with the last time we looked at Joseph, just to get a refresher here. Genesis chapter 41, starting in verse 37. It says, The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all of his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom 
is the Spirit of God. So Joseph has interpreted Pharaoh's dream to him. He's told him seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. That's what the dream means. And I think that you, Pharaoh, should prepare. You should use those seven years of plenty to prepare for the seven years of famine. Pharaoh likes that plan. He sees that Joseph is one in whom the Spirit of God dwells. And now he says to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne, Joseph, will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said again to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his finger, and he put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in the robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And the people shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. Don't get it mistaken, Joseph. I am Pharaoh. But without your word, Without your command, no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphonath paneah and gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, to be his wife. I practiced those words just for you guys tonight so that the Arkansan wouldn't come out. And Joseph then went throughout the land of Egypt. I want you to know I really was anxious about this. What we see in these verses is that Joseph's new power, his new position, his new role comes with a responsibility that Joseph is clearly willing to accept. He is now in charge. Pharaoh says it in a million different ways, but he's saying the same thing each time. He is now in charge of the entire land of Egypt. No one will do anything, Pharaoh assures Joseph, without his direct command unless Joseph says that it will be so. Pharaoh even gives him a new name. He gives him a wife. And Joseph could have reluctantly gone along with all of this. I mean, we don't actually know if he wants these things or not, like that Pharaoh is giving him. Not entirely. But instead, what we see from Joseph is that Joseph views these things as something that God is working through to bring about his will. Joseph, even now, as he finds himself in a position of power in Egypt, may not actually want all of this. In fact, we don't seem to get the idea that he could have turned Pharaoh down. Uh, But Joseph sees this and uses this as an opportunity to work for God's will. Joseph will say later on that the things that happened to him in his life happened because God wants to use him. And we see that attitude in the way that Joseph now pursues these ventures that Pharaoh has put out before him. These tasks that Pharaoh has assigned to him. Joseph is not seen to be apathetically spending his days lounging around the palace. He leaves. He gets to work on behalf of his new king. If we continue reading in verse 46, it says that Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he went out from Pharaoh's presence, and he traveled throughout Egypt. He doesn't just stay put. He doesn't just accept this awesome new life that he's been given in charge. He goes out. He gets to work. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully, and Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt, and he stored it in its cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. And it was so much that he stopped keeping records, because it was beyond measure. Joseph is actively seeking to do the work that was given to him as best as he can do it. He collects the food, he stores the food, he keeps record of the food. That is, until he can no longer keep record of it, because it's just so plentiful. Until God has blessed his work so much that he can't even count what he's stored up anymore. Joseph is actively engaged in this land, in this place that is not his home. And does everything he can 
to complete the job that he's been given to do. Joseph has children in the land of Egypt. God blesses him with two sons. And the names that he gives to them really tell the story of how he views his work in this place. How he views the position that he's come to be at in the land of Egypt. In verse 51 it says, Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh. And he said, it is because God has made me forget all of my trouble and all of my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim. And he said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Joseph sees what he has, what he has been given, as a blessing from God. And it is from this posture that he's able to healthily engage with a culture and a people that he may have otherwise resented or remained apathetic towards. Joseph accepts this new life as a gift from God. And he uses his new position to further show his integrity and his faith in his God. And when the famine comes, at the end of this chapter, God leads all of Egypt to Joseph. When the famine hits and the people are starving and they don't know what to do, Pharaoh looks at them and he says, go see Joseph. Joseph can take care of you. And of course, we know that this is God fulfilling the promise that he's made. The promise that he made back to Abraham earlier on in this book of Genesis when he told Abraham, through your descendants, through your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. We know it's not just Egypt that comes to Joseph looking for salvation throughout this famine. It's all the world, the entire world, we're told, comes to Egypt seeking grain when they have none. This is God's work. This is God's promise being fulfilled. Pharaoh says, go to Joseph. He can take care of it. And Joseph points the people to a God who has prepared them for this trouble. So Joseph takes an Egyptian name. He takes an Egyptian wife. He takes a position in the Egyptian government, second in command of all the kingdom behind Pharaoh. Although Pharaoh says it's less behind and more beside He works to ensure that all the Egyptian people have plenty in these difficult times. And it's no surprise that by the time Joseph's brothers come to Egypt, they don't even recognize him. Like apparently Joseph, by the time his brothers come to Egypt, has begun to resemble the Egyptians so much, they don't recognize this guy. They don't realize that he speaks their language, that he can understand them. And we might look at Joseph tonight and think the same thing that they did. This man is an Egyptian through and through. Egyptian wife, Egyptian children, looking out for the welfare of the Egyptian people, second in command, an Egyptian uh, figure in the government. Joseph is starting to look pretty Egyptian to us as well. And it's for this reason that Joseph, I think, is such an important figure for us to study as we think about our position today in our world, in our time, in our culture, in our country. As we think about how, as fish out of water, we should live in a culture that is increasingly different from us. At least in what it expects and what it values from its people. Joseph does not, at any point in all of this, lose his integrity. He does not lose his faith in his God. And he never hides those things even as he rises through the ranks. Even as he continues to earn Pharaoh's favor. And we know that Pharaoh was not one who once he favored you was just stuck in that disposition. Look at the men that were in prison with Joseph. Look at the baker. Look at the cupbearer. Pharaoh is apparently fickle on occasion. But Joseph continues to earn his favor. And it's not because he hides his God his faith in his God or his integrity, Joseph is very distinct in the way that he stands out. It's the way that the people see God's Spirit on him that gains him this position in the first place. However, Joseph does not stand out as someone on the fringes of society. He doesn't stand out as someone who's on the outside looking in. That's not what causes people to take note of him. Rather, 
He stands up as an example of what someone in his society, someone living in Egypt, might strive to become. How many young Egyptians do you think look at this character that Joseph has become and they say, wow, our hero, he's awesome. The one who's taking care of us even in this challenging time. Joseph's radical engagement with Egypt's people, their culture, and their concerns does not conflict with his service to God Almighty. It allows Joseph, it allows God to earn favor favor and trust among Pharaoh and his people in increasing fashion. That's what Joseph's engagement, his total buy-in to do what God has put him here to do allows for God to do through him. Joseph does not ultimately do what he does out of a great love, we have to believe, for this place. Or even out of a great love for these people. And I say that not to make light of Joseph or to make light of what he does. Surely what Joseph does benefits the people of Egypt. Surely Joseph comes to appreciate the people that surround him. He may love the people of this country after serving them in this role. We think that he hopefully loves his wife and his family. And he may even love and respect Pharaoh for all that he has done for him. But Joseph has also seen another side of Egypt. It wasn't always good for Joseph in Egypt. People lied about him. People mistreated him. People forgot about him. And left him marginalized in prison? Joseph has seen the darker side of Egypt. He engages with the people and the culture of Egypt, not out of a love just for Egypt, but out of a love for his God. And his ability to see his situation as one through which God wants to work. Joseph's love of his God allows him to more perfectly care for and show compassion on the people of Egypt. Because of his integrity, because of his devotion to his God, he's able to more faithfully and more honestly serve and love these people. If Joseph does not believe that God wants to use him to save these people, then there is no way that he's able to accomplish the things that he does in just seven short years before the time of famine comes. After all, it is God who can save these people. And Joseph has made no small note of that. But Joseph sees God's plan, and he chooses to be a vessel through whom God can accomplish salvation. Not just for Egypt, but for the entire world. If I can share my opinion with you tonight, I'll speak just personally for a moment. I believe that it is in a way like Joseph's that we can best engage with our culture today. I believe that we can best stand out by standing up within our culture as highly invested, highly motivated people. Joseph elevates the perception of his way of living and his God through such methods. And I think that it can be this way for us as well. It may be easy for us to see people around us, to see that they value things that we don't value, to see that they expect things that we don't expect from what it means to be a part of this culture. And it may be easy for us to view all these things and to treat the people around us apathetically, to treat them as like the other. What's worse, it may be easy for us to view the people in our larger culture as enemies and to find satisfaction knowing that their destruction, that their doom will one day come because they do not follow God and they are not wary of His ways and His statutes. Jesus' call was not to stand idly by while our enemies destroy themselves as they walk to their path to destruction. Jesus' call was to actively love and pray for our enemies and do everything we can to see that they come to know God. We can do the most to help people in our culture and in our world when we see, or help people rather, to see our God whenever we see ourselves 
when we ourselves become and are seen as active, outstanding, and upstanding contributors to our communities and to our land. Joseph does not show Pharaoh that he is different simply by saying it. Joseph wins the favor of Pharaoh and the rest of Egypt by showing that he is willing to be a part of the solution to their problems. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, here's what you should do. And he spearheads it. He does what's needed for the benefit of those people. He does not warn of impending danger and then stand to the side and watch it happen. He seeks to help the Egyptians avoid the catastrophe that this famine would have been had it not been for God's instruction. I think God calls us to do the same. We may not be of this world if we are in Christ. The world may not like us because it views us as different in Christ. But here we are, living in this world. How can we, like Joseph, show our God to the people living around us each day? Being engaged like we've talked about tonight is different enough, I believe, to allow God to work through us to benefit and save the people that need Him in our world. And of course, if Joseph's example is not enough for us, we need look no further than how God chose to engage in a world that did not always value the same things that he values, that did not view righteousness the way that he viewed righteousness, that did not expect what God showed was to be expected. After all, Jesus did not stand on the outside of society when he came and say, come to me. He went into that dark and desolate place He went into the worst places and ate with sinners and tax collectors. He stood in the temple itself and taught the people that he believed were missing the mark. He was willing to become a part of their culture and stand up in it to be a light for the world to see. And whenever that didn't work, whenever that was not enough, he was willing to go to a different kind of hill. A hill on a cross, or a hill with a cross, bearing the sin and the shame of humanity so that he could bring salvation to all. Maybe that story touches you tonight. Maybe that story resonates with you tonight. Maybe we see the love and the compassion that God has for us, and you need to respond to that message tonight. Or maybe, maybe Joseph's story strikes you. Maybe Joseph's radical engagement in his culture, when it would be easy to expect him to do the exact opposite, challenges you, challenges us, to think about the way that we engage in our culture. How can we best help the people in our communities, in our country, to see God, to come to know Him and to accept Him? Maybe Joseph's story challenges the way that we think about that tonight. Maybe we need to respond by humbling ourselves, seeking and searching for God's will like Joseph did. However it is that this message reaches you, however it is that the Spirit of God works in you to help us respond to this, I pray that you would respond to the message now as we stand and as we sing.